Hello again. Um, this lecture is designed just to explain the experimental design of the major social psychological experiments that um, were covered in the video you already watched. So hopefully you've already watched that Discovering Psychology video. If you haven't, please pause this video, go watch that one which I linked in your hyperdoc, and then come back because this video isn't going to make a lot of sense without the visual examples that you saw in the Discovering Psychology um, lesson. Um, so having said that, we're going to start with the one experiment that was not in that video. Um, so this, I hope you remember from our attitudes lesson a long time ago about cognitive dissonance, right? So cognitive dissonance is the idea that if you have conflicting thoughts, right, or if your attitudes and your actions conflict with each other, they clash, you're going to change one to match the other. And typically what this means is that you change your attitude or your thinking to match your behavior, right? This is called cognitive dissonance. We talked about it before. Um, the experiment that was done, that Leon Festinger did to discover or prove cognitive dissonance was designed like this. Participants were brought in to do a super boring task, something like just counting things or like writing the same line over and over for an hour, like a ridiculously boring task, right? Then they had to come out and tell the next subject who was waiting that they enjoyed the experiment. So basically they had to come do something boring and then lie to the next person in line and say it was fun. Half of the participants were paid a dollar to lie and say that the experiment was fun. The other half were paid $20 to lie. Um, so the result was that the subjects that were only paid a dollar to do the experiment, at the end, they were given a survey, right? So participant comes in and does a boring task. They lie to the next subject and say they enjoyed it. And then they do a survey about whether they actually enjoyed it or not. Right? So you would expect everyone to say on the survey, this was super boring, and then to just lie to the next person to get the money, right? But the subjects that were only paid a dollar to lie on the survey said that they enjoyed the experiment. The people that were paid $20 to lie on the survey, no, it's boring. I hated it, right? So this is really strange. Why would the people that were paid less money to do the experiment have enjoyed it more than the people who were paid more, right? And the reason is cognitive dissonance because everyone was asked to lie to the next subject in line, right? So the people that were only paid a dollar had very little external motivation to lie. You're not paying me a lot enough to tell this person that this experiment was fun. So why did I tell that person the experiment was fun? Well, I must have actually enjoyed the experiment. Attitude change, right? When made aware of the conflict between attitudes and behavior, people change their attitude to match their behavior. So these people, when they were asked on the survey, did you enjoy this experiment? Yes, no. And then they have to think about it and go, huh, well, I told this other guy that I really liked the experiment and I didn't really get paid much to do it. So if I'm going to tell him it was fun, it must have actually been kind of interesting. So I'm going to say I enjoyed it, right? And then they'll actually believe in their minds that they enjoyed the experiment more. Um, I will put a link in the hyperdoc to have a bigger explanation or a more um, in-depth explanation of the ex experiment because it's kind of hard for people to grasp. Um, but yeah, cognitive dissonance basically, um, if attitudes and actions clash, we are going to change our attitudes to match our actions. The next experiment, so this is the point where if you have not um, watched that Discovering Psychology video, I would encourage you to please do so. Uh, the next experiment is on conformity, and it's an experiment that was designed by Solomon Ash. Um, so, the design of this experiment, Ash brought, had a room full of Confederates. Imagine like a conference table with, you know, maybe eight to ten people at the table that were all Confederates. They were being paid by him to be part of the experiment. So there's only one actual participant in the study. Everyone else is on Solomon Ash's team right? He asks the participants to make simple perceptual judgments. He showed them three vertical lines and then had a target line and said, which line uh, matches? Which one is the same length as the target line? Very easy visual task. There's no way you would get it wrong. It's obvious, right? But the Confederates all gave the wrong answer out loud. And then you get to the participant. So you have eight other people all give the obviously wrong answer to this simple perceptual judgment, 
and then you get to the participant. And the result was that 70% of the participants conformed with the group on at least one trial that they participated in. So we had 70% of people are going to do the, say the obviously wrong answer to a question just because everybody else is doing it, right? That is pretty dramatic. Um, but it's proof that conformity is really powerful. We, you might have heard the word conformity by a lot of different names. Fitting in, peer pressure is a common one that's used with teenagers for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but it's conformity. There is a social pressure to conform to the group and act like the group. And this social pressure is stronger when the group is more cohesive. Um, like in schools where you have people that are kind of all in the same situation. They're all in the same class. They all have the same teachers. Maybe they're all on the same team like for a sport, that conformity is really strong, right? So here are some of the things that influence conformity. Um, basically, conformity comes down to the normative social influence, right? Um, there's two different social influences, normative and informational. Informational social influence is the influence to change your behavior by accepting other people's opinions. This is basically by um, persuasion and facts. I'm going to give you a bunch of information and hopefully that will influence your behavior. That's the informational influence. Normative social influence is the desire to change behavior to fit in, to gain social approval, to follow social norms. That's a major cause of conformity. We want to try to gain social approval and avoid social disapproval. We do that by doing the same thing as everyone else. Follow the rules, dress how you're supposed to dress, talk how you're supposed to talk, you know, don't do the things that other people don't do. That's the normative social influence, and it is a strong factor influencing conformity. That's why if a group is more cohesive or has a stronger bond, that normative influence is stronger because you have a stronger desire to gain the approval of those people. The next experiment we're going to cover is Stanley Milgram's experiment on obedience um, or the power of authority. So this is the electric shock experiment, right? The design is the participants were told it was a study about memory, about teaching and learning. The participants were told to administer electric shocks to a learner, right, through a wall. So the participant, I don't know if you remember from the footage, but the participant had like a big panel, looked like a big panel of a bunch of switches for different like levels of electrical shock. And then over the speaker could hear the learner sort of reacting to the shocks or saying the answers. The learner was an actor. No actual electrical shocks were delivered. The learner was just acting and like screaming in a microphone, pretending to be getting shocked, right? But the participants don't know that. They thought they were really shocking someone. So there would be some kind of a stimulus response, like a memory test. And every time that learner got a question wrong, this, the teacher, which was the actual participant, would give them a stronger and stronger electrical shock with each mistake, up to a lethal range. And the Switches that were marked, that, um, that were potentially lethal, were marked with like big red letters and scary skull and crossbones images and whatever. So it was really obvious that the lethal shocks were in fact lethal. But over 60% of participants, it's basically two thirds, delivered all possible shocks, including the lethal shocks, purely because they were told to by Stanley Milgram, by a dude in a lab coat. Right? If you remember from the footage, it's pretty powerful. Milgram is just sitting back there going, continue, teacher, continue, right? And the teacher just does it. Um, and in no case did somebody, did a participant get up to go help the learner without asking permission first from the authority figure. Um, ethically, this is not great, right? The biggest ethical consideration in Solomon Ash's conformity experiment is deception. He lied to the participants and didn't do a great job debriefing them afterwards. Um, but Milgram, ethically, at first it can be a little confusing, like, why is this unethical? Nobody's actually being shocked. But those participants have to leave that study knowing that they are capable of murdering a person because they were told to for a science experiment. That's not even a great reason, right? It's not like the learner committed a war crime and you're having to put them on trial for something. No, it's literally Milgram told you to shock this guy, so you shocked him to death. Having to walk around the rest of your life with the knowledge that you're capable of that, that's not great, right? That's emotional trauma. That's why this experiment is so unethical, is the emotional trauma that it inflicted on the participants. Um, and even me teaching you this, that two-thirds of us are that strongly influenced to obey authority that we will do heinous, dangerous things, but it's part of human nature. Authority is really powerful. 
Um, I have been relying on authority, on the, the presence of power to influence your behavior all year, right? That teacher look that teachers give where I sort of look over my glasses and it makes you stop talking, that is pure wielding of basically this principle authority and the tendency of people to obey authority. Um, if you go back and rewatch that Discovering Psychology video again, just the part of Milgram, pay attention to all the little commands that he gives to the learner, to the teachers, to the participants before they start shocking people, right? He builds up an attitude of obedience in them. It's the foot in the door phenomenon again, right? Walk this way, step over here, sit in this chair, put your coat there. Lots of little commands, obeying small things to create an attitude of obedience and deference to this experimenter, right? Then when it gets to the big stuff, the participant is much more likely to obey, especially if the person in authority looks authoritative. Lab coat, glasses, suit, very stern, right? If your teacher showed up to school every day in like Hawaiian shirts and jeans and flip-flops and were super casual all the time, you probably wouldn't obey us as much, right? Teachers dress professionally because it gives us a commanding presence and helps influence a, sen a sense of authority, right? The final experiment we're going to talk about is Philip Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment. The purpose of this experiment was to demonstrate the power of social situations, right? That situations have much more power over our behavior than we'd like to admit, right? So this was a simulated prison. It was all college students who were all psychologically healthy at the start. Half of them were told they were going to be prison guards and the other half were prisoners. Um, but the problem is everybody fell into their roles so hard that they had to end the experiment a week and a half early. Um, so the guards became super sadistic and like mean and rude. The prisoners became withdrawn and started, started showing extreme stress responses. The researchers took on the role of wardens and stopped being objected to the experiment. Basically self-perception theory, the idea that you become who you pretend to be is really strong. Um, and it influenced everybody in this experiment to such a degree that they had to call it off. Um, I'm summarizing this in a pretty severe way. Uh, you really need to watch that Discovering Psychology video because Zimbardo shows you actual footage from his experiment in that video and it's really powerful. Um, also in this sort of extend portion of the hyperdoc that I linked to you, it has the um, Zimbardo's website for the Stanford Prison Experiment so you can actually go and read a lot more. Um, and see and get a lot more detail and pictures and video clips and all kinds of things about the prison experiment. So if you're interested in this, please go read over that website because it has a lot more depth than just this basic summary that I've given you. But this is a pretty powerful experiment. Um, lots of ways it was unethical. All of the participants experienced emotional trauma. The prisoners, obviously, because they were treated like crap in a prison. The guards, too, because they were made aware of how sadistic they could become. The researchers lost their objectivity and started participating as wardens in the experiment. That's not good. Um, the extreme stress responses that it caused in the participants, that was a problem. So there were a lot of ethical problems with this. Um, Philip Zimbardo has done a lot of work to try to make this right. Um, with the website and everything else. And he also goes around the country now lecturing about his prison experiment and trying to advocate for prison reform in actual jails where a lot of the same abuses that his participants went through um, are suffered by real people in real prisons all the time and much worse things too um, because of the corrupting nature of power and the power of social situations to change behavior. So um, I encourage you to go read about that. Uh, otherwise, that is it for this video lecture. Please complete the rest of the activities in your HyperDoc, and I'll see you next time.